Hi, I'm Andrew Lim. I'm 21 this year, and I'm an underwater photographer. I've been scuba diving for the past nine years, and it's been really scary to see how um, pollution and overfishing have affected the marine life. But first, uh, before I continue, can I see a raise of hands? How many of you eat beef? Yeah, sukiyaki, uh, beef rendang. Oh, I'm hungry already. Okay, thanks. Put your hands down. Um, how many of you know where your beef comes from? Do you think, okay, you can put your hands down. Do you think there were cows that were hunted in the wild by cold storage and fair price? <laughs> or were they farmed cows? Yeah, okay, now, can I see a show of hands again? How many of you have eaten shark's fins before? Come on, just raise them up. Okay, thank you, you're gonna have your hands down. I wonder, okay, how many of you are still eating shark's fins? And to those people, do you know where your shark's fins come from? <laughs> Not dolphins. <laughs> okay, okay, um, now, now, let me continue. Um, I have been fascinated by marine life since young. And you know, my passion has been growing since then, I know, each year, with each year that passes by. Um, <coughs> I didn't grow up in cartoons at all, except for Batman and Street Sharks. Those were awesome. But other than that, I spend most of my time on TV watching National Geographic and Discovery Channel. I hated reading, but I had my own encyclopedia collection. I remember there were a couple of times where I was in primary school and I got scolded, you know, for taking out an encyclopedia to read instead of a storybook, which is, I think, quite ridiculous. I don't know, if I were the, te the teacher, I'd be really impressed, right? <laughs> um, <coughs> as time went by, <coughs> um, you know, it's always been my childhood dream to publish my own book. When I was 13 years old, I got my open water diving certification. And when I was 17, I got my first underwater camera. It's basically a DSLR fixed in an overly priced plastic container. <laughs> After the completion of my diploma in communications and media management, in Tomasic Polytechnic, I realized, you know, I've got a lot of time before enlisting to national service. So I, told, I, to, I, I thought to myself, why don't I, I make full use of this time and really work towards my dream? At that point in time, my parents also got me a new camera setup. I really cannot thank them enough for that. I'm, it really meant the world to me. You know, I, and I quickly went and booked my tickets and accommodation for two months stay uh, to Manado, Indonesia. It's a diver's paradise. I was all set to go. And then, um, just two nights before I was supposed to fly off, I got involved in a hit and, run, hit and run accident. What happened was, I was putting my bicycle into a boot of a taxi, when suddenly, another taxi comes ramming to me from behind, sandwiching my, my left knee in between the two cars. Yeah, my knee was the only point of contact. And because of that, you know, both bumpers were dented quite badly, and I was rushed straight to a &E hospital. Um, it did hurt. <laughs> uh, but you see, the main thing was that it really delayed, you know, my whole project. Uh, the doctors told me, you know, miraculously, thank God, you know, for some reason or another, no bones are broken. <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but there was still bone injury, <laughs> which still hurts now and then. But, you know, I told myself, one month's rest, after that, I'm all set to go. I'm going to go and achieve my dream altogether. You know, I'm not going to let this affect me at all. So I rested, and then I flew off after a month, still with a healing injured leg. Um, I worked really hard on this project. I spent a, a month in Indonesia uh, diving three to four dives a day, sometimes waking up as early as 5.30 in the morning to set up my underwater camera equipment because it is quite a tedious process. Mm, then, yeah, you know, I spent some time, you know, underwater documenting the marine life, but I also spent some time up in the mountains and in the villages by the sea to document um, the cultures and the livelihoods of the villages. Because when I travel, I believe in soaking in the whole, you know, the culture and the whole atmosphere. I even ate some of their local delicacies, which included um, rat meat and bat meat. <laughs> Try bat meat. It tastes like uh, mutton, but rat meat... Uh, I tried it like all over the world and really it's not the style of cooking that tastes bad. <laughs> um, I also spent some time in the jungles to take photos of the wildlife that I just ate. I I'm kidding. But yeah, the other wildlife. And I'm done with this. Silhouette of Serenity. It's basically a coffee table book, you know, of the photos that I took during my trip. And I'm going to show you more of what I took. Over here, we have got the 
the sea coral whip shrimp. Uh, if your eyes are sharp enough, you can actually see three of them perched on this whip coral. You see, it's amazing, you know, the colors and the details of their bodies, how they really camouflage with the coral that they stay on to survive in this harsh environment. Here we've got a pygmy seahorse. It was really hard to spot it. I mean, look at the size. Not only the size, but the colors and the details on its body, the patterns, the camouflage is, is fantastic. It's out of this world, you know. It was a real pain shooting this guy, but I mean, it was really fun at the same time. And here, fighting to be crowned king of camouflage, we've got the flatfish. Uh, I don't know whether you can see which is the fish, but these are the eyes, and here's the mouth, and here's the body. Well, they use this camouflage to basically ambush its prey, as well as to escape its predators. You know, not only can these animals do amazing Houdini acts, but they can, they are really intelligent as well. Um, and the best example would be my favorite fish, and that is the frogfish. It is probably one of the laziest yet cutest fish around, and I say that because they are fish that don't even swim. <laughs> they just drag their fat bodies you know, at the bottom of the seabed and wait for prey. But, okay, they don't just wait for prey. If you look closely, there is a white speck at the top of his head, and that is actually a lure, which will wriggle around near its mouth, attracting smaller prey to come, like fish and shrimps that think, oh, look, there's food. And then they come closer and closer, and then this guy will open his huge mouth and swallow the whole prey whole. And here we've got a crab on a cassopia. A cassopia is basically an upside down jellyfish. And you might be wondering, why? Why would this crab stay on a jellyfish, right? Nothing better to do. But you see, the jellyfish gives the crab protection, you know, from its venomous stings. And at the same time, the crab is always transported to more abundant waters. And here we've got um, Master of Disguise, the octopus, which is also one of the world's most intelligent creatures around. Now we've got fish that will go to extreme extents um, of you know, protecting its eggs. Here we've got a jawfish. You look in its mouth and you can see these yellow things. Those are actually eggs, hundreds and hundreds of eggs, all stuffed in its mouth. And during this process, the male, the male take care, takes care of the eggs, doesn't feed until the eggs hatch. And well, <coughs> with time, the eggs slowly develop, and you can actually see the eyes of each fry and each egg. Pretty amazing stuff. We've got also very opportunistic animals out at sea. What you're looking at here is the face of a clownfish, you know, Finding Nemo, the proper term, clownfish. This is the face of a clownfish, and if you look into its mouth, you see the, these two beady eyes staring at you. It isn't a clownfish trying to protect its young, no. It's, in fact, a tongue-eating louse. It is a parasite. Just like something out of a horror show, it swims into the mouth of a fish, bites off the tongue, and replaces the tongue with itself, and where it feed on the blood of the fish there for the rest of its life. Oh, right. But, do you know how fascinating these creatures are? No, 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 seriously, because these low lives, okay, they understand the concept of sustainability. You know, it doesn't overfeed on a fish's blood. I mean, if we're in that situation, we'll like just gorge ourselves, right? <laughs> like in a buffet. But this guy, you know, he doesn't overfeed on the blood of the fish because he knows that if it feeds on too much blood, the fish will die, right? And what happens when a fish dies? He will die too. It is really sad to say, to safety say that we humans can learn a thing or two from these low lives. You know, we've been feasting on the Earth's natural resources without giving it enough time you know, to, you know, to get everything back and yeah, replenish itself. And what happens when, when that happens you know, in time to come? The Earth will die. And then what happens to us? I think the tongue-eating Laos would know better. Well, out at sea, we've got, you know, other very, very venomous creatures as well. Over here, we've got the banded sea crate. It is a sea snake that is highly potent. The venom is really potent. But the beauty of this creature is that it is really docile. Right after this photo was taken, uh, this snake actually swam onto my arm and onto my camera and rested there for the next 15 minutes of my dive. It was an amazing moment. You see, all of us here today, we're all gonna, you know, 
experience and, and encounter wildlife you know, throughout this life of ours. And it is very important to respect these animals. You, know, you give these animals the respect, and they in turn will respect you too. Now, can anyone make a guess? What is this fish inside? Anyone? No? Okay, it is in fact a glass bottle that has been covered with sponge and soft coral. Unfortunately, you see, not all these marine life benefit from litter like this fish has. Um, you know, from all these pictures that you've just seen, all these amazing creatures, they're about a mere fraction of everything else that lies out there. And, it, you know, although you might see them in photos, nothing compares to seeing them in person, you know, going down, diving down, and experiencing them in their own natural habitat. And only when you do that can you begin to understand just how magnificent and amazing these creatures are. Unfortunately, if you're going to continue littering, overfishing, and basically just ruining the whole environment, these creatures will not last for much longer. Our children, our grandchildren, especially our great-grandchildren, will not be able to witness these amazing creations. Now, back to the topic on sharks. I took this photo at a fish market in Manado. Uh, as you can tell, the whole body is gone, the fins are gone. That is because, you know, the whole shark is in use. But do you know that outside of this, millions of sharks are killed each year just for its fins? Millions, okay? If that doesn't impact you enough, do you know how these sharks are killed? The first fish up onto the boat, the fins are chopped off, and their whole bodies are thrown back at sea. It's like me taking you on a boat ride, chopping off your arms and legs and throwing you overboard. Basically, you just sink to the bottom and drown. It is very inhumane. You know, I'm sure you've heard of all these um, shark fin trade talks, but the one thing that really impacts me most and, and saddens me is that these fishermen who, who hunt, the, who fish these sharks, they, they don't care what species they've caught, you know, be it an endangered species, or a threatened species. To them, a fin is just a fin, and a fin means money. And when I say that, just imagine, okay, the next bowl of shark's fin soup you are eating could probably be the last of its species that you've just helped make ex extinct. Think about it. Okay, don't think about it now. Think about it after I'm done, okay? I've got plenty more to say. <laughs> um, on to happier stuff. After the completion of this book, I was thinking to myself, you know, what else can I do to fully utilize uh, this project of mine? You know, I'm spreading the awareness and appreciation of marine life and how important it is to, of conservation and sustainability. But what else can I do? In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a good family friend of mine, uh, the Secretary General of Singapore Kindness Movement, Dr. William Wan. And it was during that talk where I took a big step. You know, I, I decided to give, you know, part of the proceeds to charity. I have always wanted to do something with my talents to help the people around me, but I lacked opportunity. The last time was probably during uh, two years back when I was still representing Singapore in the national rock climbing team. When I took part um, in the President's Challenge, it was this rock climbing competition. But I don't think I raised a lot of money winning the competition. Um, so after this book was done, you know, I thought to myself, look, this is, you know, this is an opportunity in itself. Why don't I just use this first project and give it back to society? And besides, I'm just 21. I don't need so much money right now, although I could use it <laughs> to buy a car. <laughs> but you know, other people would benefit a lot more from it right now. Um, so the money is uh, going to go to a charity, a prison's charity. Um, and you know, I've told them, you know, I want the money to go to the children whose parents are in prison. You might be wondering, why? Why this charity, you know? Uh, there's so many other charities out there, and that is because I, I have a soft spot for children. You know, I have been blessed to be born in a good home with supportive parents. And it's because of that, you know, that I get to do so many things like, you know, travel. I started snorkeling since three years old. And it is all these experiences that make me who I am today. And, it, well, that's why I'm able to do all these. And, you know, these children, you know, whose parents are in prison, they... They don't have the parents around to nurture them, to, to you know, bring them up. 
And I'm really, really sad because they lack opportunity, you know, they lack the discovery. And I believe that it's very important to discover your interests since young. So I hope, you know, the money can help them with their education and their upbringing. And someday, find an interest, you know, and work on it, and hopefully use their newfound talents to help the people around them too. Now, um, can we all just take a step back and just think of these few questions. What are your talents? What is your purpose? Is it to strive to be the best by eating the rest? Or is it to be the best by helping those in distress? What can your talents do to not just benefit you, but the people around you too? I used to think that my photos could only be used for educational purposes, but I thought out of the box, and I urge you to do the same thing too. With this, I'd like to end my talk with three last messages. Firstly, <laughs> reach for your dreams. Your childhood dreams are your most honest dreams. You know, no matter how unconventional they are, just go for it, okay? And find your niche. Next, while you're working on it, take a step back and, and really think, you know, what is, what is it that's supporting your whole life, everything you're doing, and that is our environment. Because as of now, we are worse off than a tongue-eating Laos, and we have, a lot of, we have a lot to learn. And lastly, I urge you to bless the less fortunate with the talents you've been blessed with. Thank you.